All right, welcome back to Learning Objective 2 of the Return to Normalcy. So we're discussing the two phases of the Republican domestic program uh, from 1921 to 1933. Uh, it's important to understand it's frequently said that the Republican administration of the 1920s favored laissez-faire, that's hands-off, uh, government-free regulation of the economy from the government. Right, what we studied in an earlier lecture, laissez-faire, part of the big values. Um, this is true only if one defines laissez-faire as absence of government restraint on business. In many cases, uh, Republican administrations use the power of the federal government to aid business enterprises. Um, and the philosophy that they went by is, is, is known today as trickle-down economics, sometimes referred to as Reagan economics, but it, it goes all the way back to um, Hamiltonian economics. Um, and what it is, let's take a look at it right here, is this is a diagram of it right here. So trickle-down economics, sometimes referred to as um, supply-side economics, Reagan economics, but it, again, it goes back all the way to Hamilton's uh, idea of the role of government uh, within the economy. So you have government support up here. Government supports wealthy individuals and big business. In turn, wealthy individuals and big business invest in the economy by opening up factories, uh, financial centers, um, public works, whatever the case may be, to profit themselves. Um, this creates, obviously, new business and, in turn, more jobs for the common person's uh, ability to have purchasing power. In turn, that person's ability, the, the, the ability for the common man to have more purchasing power, this is going to stimulate business. Stimulating business creates more profit. More profit creates uh, a bigger tax base where the government can, in turn, keep supporting wealthy business and big individuals, where they can keep investing, where it can create new jobs, where the common person has more purchasing power, that's dollars in the pocket, which stimulates business, which creates more profit, which creates a better basis for government to be supported. So that's Ken, that's tr uh, trickle-down economics. Sometimes uh, the opposing economics, and in, in ge generally speaking, is, is sometimes referred to as Keynesian economics or grassroots economics. This is where the government goes into debt, and the government goes into debt here as well, but the government goes into debt and pays the, the, um, that debt directly to creating new jobs and more businesses, like creating, um, you know, the, for um, building roads, public works projects, dams, um, welfare, um, whatever the case may be, giving money directly to the common person. Uh, and the theory is, is that this will stimulate business, this will create more profits, this will create a bigger tax base, and in turn, a wealthy, uh, big business will benefit from the cycle because people have money in their pockets to pay um, for things that they need at businesses. All right. So those are the two opposing. Now, the Republicans, traditionally, generally speaking, uh, favor uh, trickle-down economics. And again, this is a very generalized um, outline of both of these economic philosophies. And to do this, um, we, we begin to see this in the tax structure with the Revenue Acts from 1921 to 1929. So the Revenue Act of 1921 eliminated the wartime excess profit tax on business and reduced the maximum tax rate on personal tax from 65% to 50%. And still, I mean, that's a lot of tax. The, I think the, the, the most, the maximum tax rate now is 35%. Um, uh, Secretary of, of the Treasurer, Andrew Mellon, this guy right here, uh, wanted the maximum rate to be only 32%. However, the law did raise the corporate tax rate uh, from 10 to 12.5% while granting some relief to lower income groups with higher exemptions for dependents. This act was the first step in Andrew Mellon's uh, program of tax reduction for the wealthy. Mellon argued that wealthy people would not invest in industry if income taxes took a large share of the return. 
1924, the, Retur uh, the Revenue Act lowered the maximum rate to 40%. Um, the general prosperity of 1925 to 1929 brought increased tax revenues and surpluses to the federal government, thus helping Mellon in his program to reduce taxes on large, uh, large incomes. The Revenue Act of 1926 lowered the maximum tax on income down to 20%, reduced corporation taxes, cut the inheritance tax by half, and eliminated the gift tax altogether. So this aid to the wealthy increased the marked inequality in wealth, which was one of the major causes of the crash and uh, the Great Depression beginning in 1929. Thus, in 1929, 5% of the population with the highest incomes received approximately one-third of all personal income. Thus, lowering the lower classes had virtually no purchasing power. So this highly uneven income distribution meant that the economy was dependent on a high level of investment or on a high level of luxury consumer spending or both. So this, this is where lies the problem. The rich cannot buy um, great quantities of bread if they are uh, disposed of what they receive. It must be on luxuries or by way of investment in new plants and new projects. Uh, and you know, and the, the money supplied does not circulate in a very healthy way throughout the economy. So throughout the 20s, production and productivity per worker grew steadily. And between 1919 and 1929, output per worker in manufacturing industries increased by about 45 percent. Wages, salaries, and prices all remained comparatively stable um, or in any case underwent no comparable increase. Accordingly, costs fell. With the prices the same, profits inc increased. These profits sus uh, sustained the spending of the well-to-do, and they also nourished at least some of the expectations behind the stock market boom. Most of all, they encouraged a high level of capital investments. So herein lies the problem. The question is, who is to buy the products which these extra capital goods produced if the common person has no purchasing power to speak of? Um, what happens after the common person's purchasing power is saturated and business keeps producing goods and building up investors which cannot be con uh, inventories which cannot be consumed um, when people get laid off as a result of this overproduction they will have no they will have further no purchasing power in which case the downward cycle for the economy will be greatly accelerated so the revenue act of 1928 left personal income taxes at the 1926 rate, but reduced corporation taxes still further. One can make a strong argument that if it was economically unwise to reduce, reduce taxes on high incomes at all, much of the incomes thus saved from the tax collector went into land and stock speculation and contributed greatly to the crash of 1921. This tax policy was transferred much of the tax burden from the rich uh, to the middle and poor classes. If wealth had been taxed at the rate it had been during or soon after the war, more of the national debt could have been retired, or the high revenues could have been used for vigorous government farm uh, programs um, and, and an economically healthier distribution of income. But cutting government expenses, the Republicans did balance the federal budget for a time. Government expenditures fell from $6.4 billion in 1920 to $3.4 billion in 1922, and to a low of $3 billion in 1927. Hence, the Republicans were able to achieve a surplus every year until 1929 and were thus able to reduce the national debt from $25.5 billion in 1919 to $16.9 billion in 1929. So they did that. Um, however, it came at a great cost to the economy. It's no wonder 
the business community asserted with one voice that Andrew Mellon was the greatest Secretary of Treasury since Alexander Hamilton. But again, his policies um, were highly imbalanced and it was causing um, a maldistribution of wealth throughout the uh, general economy. Um, you also have the, the external tax structure or the tariff policy from 1922 uh, to 1932. Uh, beginning with the Underwood tariff, a low tariff had been really had not been really tried uh, under normal conditions. For the war itself, afforded protection to American manufacturers um, and fostered the establishment of new industries. At the conclusion of the war, these infant industries, chemicals, dyes, hardwares, and so forth, clamored for protection. Wilson vetoed Congress's attempt to pass a protective tariff. Um, the reason? Uh, if there ever was a time when America had anything to fear from foreign competition, that time has passed. If we wish to have Europe settle her debts, governmental or commercial, we must be prepared to buy from her. So before World War I, the United States was a debtor nation. We owed countries money. But during and after the war, the United States became a creditor nation. Countries owed us money. When the United States was a debtor nation, the surplus of our exports, things going out over our imports, things coming in, had paid the interest and principal on our loans from Europe. Now that the United States was a creditor nation, the profits from our surplus exports were added to the debt that European countries now owed us. During the 1920s, the surplus of American exports over imports continued, and European countries continued to get deeper in debt. And this was going to be a major problem. This meant that European countries could do one of the following. They could increase their exports to the United States. They could re reduce their imports. They can draw on reparations from Germany. They could take out new loans, or they can default on their past loans. President Harding, Coolidge, Hoover, and the Congress moved promptly to eliminate the first possibility, that European accounts would be balanced by larger imports, imports by sharply increasing American tariffs. Accordingly, debts, including war debts, went into default, and there was a precipitous fall in American exports. So the economy is getting hit on all fronts. Nevertheless, in the 1920s, the mood of the heart of Harding and the country was the fear of the fear that the United States would be inundated with the products of depressed European labor. Right, it would f flood our market, um, creating an unfair uh, trade trade balance uh, with domestic companies, um, and and so in putting out American business. This was the fear, right? So at the request of Harding, Congress pushed through a high protective tariff uh, in September 1922. And was it high? It's called the Ford, Fordney-McCumber Tariff. The Fordney-McCumber Tariff established rates higher than ever before, up to 400%. The Fordney-McCumber Act provided, uh, provoked a tariff war, which cut briefly into foreign trade, consequently persuading many manufacturers to establish uh, branch plants abroad in order, in order that they may compete more effectively, which in turn put American workers out of work. The net result of this high tariff was that it made almost impossible for any European nation to replenish their financial reserves and rebuild their economy when the American market was sealed off by the tariff, thus making it difficult um, for them to pay off the $10.3 billion they had borrowed from the United States during the war, a debt the United States refused to cancel as her share of the war effort. And so what the high tariff thus encouraged was inefficient production, allowed business to make artificial profits, profits based on inefficient production and unstable uh, cor a corporate structure um, and holding companies, and gave people faith in 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 the gave people a false faith in the economy. So why this happens is, is that if um, 
American businesses will become inefficient because they don't have to compete with foreign companies. And so, because they are locked out, no, no, no one's going to send us products from abroad if they have to pay a 400% tax, right? And so, since American companies don't have to compete with that, it makes them inefficient, um, and it makes for a very um, a sloppy corporate system, a very inefficient corporate system. But it gives an initial boost to domestic companies, um, American companies, these tariffs. And so it looks like for the first couple of years, hey, it might be working. And so people begin to have this faith in the economy and they begin to invest in the in economy by buying bonds, by buying stocks. But what they don't know is that it's going to lead to overproduction and it's going to lead to higher costs and it's going to lead to depressed wages over time. So thus, this misdirected faith encourage people to speculate in land and stock. However, the stock market boom of the 20s had to come to an end uh, sometime. The party always ends. This rise in the market could continue only as long as new people or new money was coming into market. Once the supply of new customers began to falter, the markets would cease to rise. Once the market stopped rising, a good many would start to cash in um, and the market uh, would, would tumble, as history uh, demonstrated. The market's crash is important because it revealed other weaknesses in the economy. The continued prosperity, again, after the Ford and E. McCumber tariff, however, confirmed the, uh, the Republicans in the devotion of high tariffs and in um, trickle-down economics. In the campaign in the election of 1928, Herbert Hoover stood on the Republican prosperity and reaffirmed his faith in high tariff. The results, Hoover won an easy victory over Democrat Al Smith, 444 electoral votes to 87. There was no um, urgent need for a tariff revision, but no sooner was the Hoover Inaugur um, inaugurated when he, um, then he summoned Congress in a special session to consider farm relief and limited changes in the tariff. Um, Hoover felt Americans' continued prosperity was tied to protecting American industries. And this makes sense to a certain degree because, um, I mean, the, the, the logic is that if you protect American businesses, American workers will benefit. But again, uh, without that competition, which is the life force of capitalism, um, the economy becomes terribly inefficient. The new, um, moving on to the Howley Smoot Tariff Bill, uh, uh, the new Howley Smoot Tariff Bill represented in increases all along the line. A vigorous protest from over 1,000 economists had no effect on the president who signed the bill into law in, in June of 1930. The reaction was immediate. Within two years, by 1932, um, 25 countries had established uh, retaliatory tariffs, and American foreign trade uh, dropped off as America was facing a depression and suffering from overproduction at home. American foreign trade declined from $9 billion in 1929 to $3 billion by 1932. So this is going to be of, of great consequence, right? This is going to affect a lot of workers who are going to get laid off because there's less purchasing power within the United States. There is less uh, American goods and services being shipped abroad. So in turn, that's going to come back and bite American workers in the butt. And there will be further layoffs. Um, so that concludes Learning Objective 2. We'll move on to Learning Objective 3, so I'll see you there. Let me know if you have any questions or concerns.